I'm talking today as both the managing director responsible for anti-money laundering advisory at Kroll, but also as the former executive secretary of the Financial Action Task Force, which is the global body responsible for, for tackling money laundering. And today at Risk at the Rock, I want to give the attendees an insight into the scale and nature of money laundering globally, the challenges that we all face, so the risks not just on the rock but the risks beyond the rock, um, and um, how we might go about um, tackling those risks, the importance of not just compliance um, but going beyond compliance uh, to share information and tackle money laundering. And I'll be giving a few examples of some of the investigations we've done at Kroll that shows how, how money laundering really takes place. And of course, Gibraltar was uh, recently greylisted by the FATF. Will you be sort of targeting your talk at all uh, in terms of what Gibraltar can be doing in this respect? So I'll, I'll probably touch on that. Um, but Gibraltar's um, uh, already well into this process. It knows what it's doing. Um, it has a few things it needs to do to get off the list uh, around confiscations uh, and around sanctions of non-financial institutions. So I think Gibraltar's in a pretty good place already. Uh, but I'll be able to touch on that and, and the likely trajectory of that activity. And uh, can you give us an idea of, uh, of what, what you'll be saying about that? Um, well, I'll only be saying that it's important that the Gibraltar authorities continue to work very cooperatively with FATF to close the gaps in, in the regime they've got, and that if they're successful in doing it, they will end up with one of the most um, strongest uh, anti-money laundering regimes in the world, which is typically what happens when countries go on the list. They have a tough time getting through that process, but they come out of it stronger the other end, and, and Gibraltar will actually be more competitive in the long run as a result of it. And you've talked about not just uh, compliance, but going beyond compliance. Can yeah. you give us an idea of what that means? So I think the, the, the activity that adds the most value today in terms of really stopping money laundering is not in the laws and regulations. We need to do that. Everyone needs to do that, of course. But it's in information sharing. It's in public-private partnerships. Um, those kind of activities where you're going beyond what's required to more proactively identify and track down dirty money. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about operation resilience and risk. Um, how to perhaps manage and assess that from um, a company or even an org you know, a large organisation point of view. Um, but I'm also going to be talking about how to test and make sure that you are, you are resilient as a company or a business um, and how to spot things on the inside. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about insider threats uh, and how people actually and how they manage themselves can sometimes make us a bit vulnerable. Um, and I'm just going to talk about what to look out for um, in your organisation and perhaps how to mitigate some of that risk. And can you give us an idea of some of these uh, tips? Um, well, I think it's really, really important to um, have a look at your organisation and what they have access to. So one of the main things is that you know people in your organisation will have access to your IT systems, to, to different offices and locations, etc. Understanding what access they have and whether that's appropriate for what they do. So a lot of the information that we, we lose, we, um, we can lose because people take it either maliciously or even non-maliciously. So having the right access is really important, I think. Um, but also assessing um, the risk that that individual may pose. So I think it's really important to look holistically at what an individual does. So has that individual, for example, does he or she have a drug habit? Um, are they suffering some financial issues? Are they disgruntled? Have they been asked to leave the organisation? So there's a number of risk factors or signals that you can have a look at when you start to think actually, and therefore should this person have, have database admin rights in our systems when there's all this going on? So there's things that you just need to be aware of and look for. Uh, and that doesn't mean to say that everyone in your organisation is going to do something they shouldn't. That's definitely not the case, but there are individuals that do and we need to be aware of those and take the right action. Um, and the other thing I think is really important is the awareness of employees who non-maliciously become an insider threat because they either download malware or they are subject of a phishing email which causes harm to the company. So they're, uh, they're completely unintentional, but nevertheless they do also cause a risk. So there's a number of things that we can do to combat that. So I'm an investigative journalist, uh, I cover organised crime and technology and today I'll be speaking particularly about how North Korea of all places became a computer hacking superpower. Can you give us a bit more idea of that? Uh, well North Korea, as probably people will know, it's sealed off from the outside world and sealed off financially as well. 
Uh, and so the accusation against North Korea is that it's used its government hackers, its government cybersecurity employees, of which lots of governments have, but North Korea's used them to go out and actually steal money for the regime, bring money back to North Korea to keep the country afloat. And the stories of how they've done that are absolutely fascinating. They're, they're kind of like Hollywood bank heists only perpetrated in cyberspace. And uh, what can, what can uh, companies, what can countries do to award against this sort of uh, attack? Well, usefully, the tactics that the hackers use to get inside the companies, banks included, cryptocurrency companies, computer gaming and, and gambling companies, the tactics they use are depressingly familiar. They will send phishing emails that look very tempting. Employees will click on them, open the attachments. They've increasingly started using LinkedIn messages and WhatsApp messages. So in a way, to stop these hackers getting in, it's the same old stuff. It's educating your staff and getting them to be on the lookout for anything suspicious and dodgy that hits their inbox, uh, either in email or social media. And as you say, North Korea is a very secretive <coughs> regime. So how do you go about uh, investigating this? Well, yeah, North Korea is cut off from the outside world. You know, the idea that we're going to be able to interview North Korean hackers is obviously not going to happen. Um, but because North Korea has hacked into so many different places, uh, allegedly over so many years, people like the United States government and the United Nations and the victims of these hacks are increasingly putting out a great deal of information about them. And so reading through these documents, reading through these reports, these allegations, these accusations, you can actually glean quite a lot about how North Korea works. And in some cases, the actual individuals doing it. I mean, the US government's charged a particular North Korean individual that named him and put out his photograph and given details about who he is and where he is. So you can actually start to imagine who these guys are on the other side of the computer keyboard. Really delighted to be here in Gibraltar to be invited again to speak on what we, on, what we see on some of the financial crime trends uh, globally, uh, not just in Europe, which has uh, gone on, undergone an unprecedented regulatory reform package, uh, but also other uh, weaknesses and financial crime risks. Uh, that we see, and, and some of those relate to uh, sanctions policy related to the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Uh, some of those relate to the, uh, the digital asset space and what we see on some of the opportunities, but also risks in, in that space as well. So we'll be sharing our views in terms of uh, our trends that we're seeing and, and how we're engaged with the industry and, and policymakers. Are there any trends that you'd like to, to pick out as being particularly uh, uh, new or striking? Yeah, so certainly the, uh, the sanctions, unprecedented sanctions uh, policy coordinated by 65 different sanctions authorities has proven to be a real challenge in the industry in terms of how to cope uh, with the amount and the types of sanctions. Um, and, and some of those really relate to uh, the fact that a majority of sanctions against the Russian Federation are what we call implicit sanctions. So, they're, so it's not just to get individuals. Uh, but they're targeting the entire sector of the Russian economy, uh, which of course impacts trade. And that is a, that is a significant change uh, that a lot of companies are struggling to keep up with. Uh, the second piece, which has also received a lot of uh, news and notoriety, is potentially the use of fraud and sanctions evasion in the in digital asset space. Um, and, and some of it's really educating the, the industry and policymakers in terms of what we see are the risks, but also that entire sector shouldn't be, um, um, you know, begin an opportunity to be classified as being used for fraud in wholesale, which is which is not. Uh, but certainly, it's very important that banks and corporates uh, and wealth management firms and, and other uh, industries are quite careful in terms of who they do business with to ensure that they don't get caught into a situation uh, that uh, you know they may be exposed to to either fraud, consumer protection issues, investor protection issues, or even sanctions evasion.